the Human Rights Act. Francis works for the Disability Law Service as a solicitor specialising in community care. The Human Rights Act came into force in 1998 in this country. Before 1998, if you had a specific claim based on a violation of one of your human rights, you had to take your case all the way to Strasbourg. But now the same rights that were available to you under the European Convention are now available in UK law. I think it's really important for disabled people and disabled people's organisations to realise that the Human Rights Act is a really key tool for them to fight for their rights and to continue fighting to get equality, to get independence, to get choice, to get control. You can use the Human Rights Act in, in quite a lot of creative and varied ways and I don't think when it first came into force that it was envisaged that it would be used in so many different ways to um, enforce people's rights. The Human Rights Act has a number of articles or parts which are particularly relevant to disabled people. The first important one I would say is Article 2 which is um, guarantees the right to life and what this, this can be used by disabled people um, in instances such as trying to get um, medical treatment um, because they can rely on that as something that the state owes them. Article 3 is freedom from inhuman or degrading treatment and although this is generally used in instances such as torture um, or extreme physical distress um, there have been a few instances where disabled people have been able to use this article. The next one that, that's a really important one and the one that I use most of all in my work is Article 8, which is right to family and private life. I think this is important for disabled people because it goes to the heart of the sorts of interventions that they are having from public bodies, such as care services, medical treatment, Finally, Article 14, that is freedom from discrimination. And this is another key article. You can't use this article on, your, on its own. So, for example, a breach of Article 8 and Article 14 would go together. I can't remember a case that I've done where I haven't cited a human rights argument. So I, th I would say that it, 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 it's almost always in there now. Um, to make a, making a human rights argument. Because if you're talking about local authorities reducing care, taking away care, or uh, going against um, the wishes of a person with a disability, I mean, there was a case that just came, that was just reported yesterday, uh, Stephen Neary in the London Borough of Hillingdon, and that was in the Court of Protection where a young man with autism was taken away from his father and put in a care home against his will and the will of the father and they've said that that was a breach of his Article 8 rights, that the local authority should have considered his wishes and what he wanted. Um, so you can see that all the time decisions are coming out um, which are considering article, uh, human rights um, legislation and how it affects people. Val Garnham was one of the first disabled people in her local authority to receive direct payments. She used them to organise her own personal assistance very happily for eight years. And then I suddenly became very ill, went to hospital, and I was told that I would have to cease receiving direct payments, go on to um, specialist nursing care, because I was now classified as needing continuing health care. It was more devastating than me honest to actually be told I wouldn't be able uh, to any longer proceed with direct payments. Val was determined to continue with direct payments rather than rely on agency carers. With direct payments, Val employs a team of five personal assistants that she's trained and that she knows well. Agency workers are renowned for being kind of temporary. It would be much more difficult for me and it would be more exhausting physically for me to train different people at different times. At the moment I travel, I go on lots of holidays and I go to our caravan which is 80 miles away. So 
to be registered with an agency, I was told, well, no, you wouldn't be able to do that anymore. So it goes back to the quality of life. And should we be restricted? I myself can't see any reason at this point in time why uh, agency workers would be better or, you know, anywhere near as good as having my own people employed by me. It gives me that much more choice, control and, you know, the flexibility. Those are the three words I would say best describe it. Val protested about the proposed move to agency care and the NHS agreed to transfer funds to her local authority so that Val could continue with direct payments. Getting on for four years ago, uh, the Secretary of State for, uh, for Health at the time uh, said it would be illegal to carry on with this. There'd been some change in the law and that any authorities, local authorities, that carried on giving people or continuing health care direct payments would be um, liable to be breaking the law. They would be breaking the law. So I would have to go on to uh, agency care and nursing. Valerie, for many years, received direct payments. She's had bad experience of agency carers before and she wanted to be independent and choose her carers decide who comes and when they come. So she contacted us and we had a look at the case and we had a look at the, the legislation as it was. And although they were, the NHS were right that in the actual legislation did not allow direct payments as it stood, we felt that there were some really significant human rights arguments as to why it should. So we used that Article 8 right because it affected her family life and her home life so fundamentally in conjunction with Article 14, which is the one about freedom from discrimination, because we said she's being discriminated against just because she's receiving her care via the NHS and not the local authority. The Disability Law Service organised legal aid and prepared the case. We made the application for judicial review and we um, got an interim injunction and that interim injunction was really important because what that did was it, it meant that Valerie was able to continue receiving the payments until the case was resolved. Now, some of these cases can take up to two, three years to get resolved. So that's actually really crucial that you can get that, um, that continuity while the dispute's going on. So Valerie didn't actually experience any breakdown in her care at all. The Disability Law Service took Val's case, together with a similar case, to the High Court. The decision went against us at the Judicial Review for quite technical legal reasons, but we appealed that decision, and just as we were waiting to go to the Court of Appeal, the, um, the Secretary of State for Health announced that he was now piloting direct payments under the NHS in about 70 pilot areas and that basically took away all of our arguments because we couldn't say that they weren't doing it when they were actually trying it out. So um, we were not able to actually conclude that as an appeal but we felt that, that by, making, by making that judicial review application we put pressure on the government to look at this issue um, more urgently than perhaps they had done so. Although we actually lost the case I do feel that the case was a great victory in that it highlighted all the issues. There was quite a lot of media coverage of it, newspapers, independent newspaper, several other newspapers, television got involved. So I felt very pleased and proud to have stuck it out. Obviously lots of disabled people were very interested in the outcome. Well, we knew that there's at least 100,000 people receiving NHS continuing care. So that's a lot of people potentially who could be affected because they're not all receiving that in the hospital. Many of them are at home. Val's local authority applied to pilot direct payments in the NHS and so she continues to receive them and to organise her own personal assistance. Direct payments does save 
with government money because I was told by the actual authorities involved in my case that it would cost three times as much for the health authority to be providing funding for me to get qualified nursing staff from an agency. Three times as much funding as it does to give me direct payments to get on with it myself. So, you know, it just wouldn't be logical in any economics. I've been out of the hospital after the serious illness for eight years now. So I've proved that it can be done. It was a human right that I would have who I wanted to do very personal things. And that I should have that choice. You know, I, I shouldn't just have things done to me. It is my right, my human right to have a say in it and have the biggest say in it. It wasn't a waste of time, you know. Um, you might think, well, you know, she fought for two and a half years and the case was lost, but I don't think it I don't look on it as being unsuccessful or a loss because in the end it really brought it out into the open um, for me and I was in my situation, like living in a similar situation. It just focused on it um, and it brought action. I think the law is very complicated and it is hard and I can't deny that, but the alternative is to um, possibly spend just as long going through, you might go through a complaints procedure, you might go up to the ombudsman, and you may not always get things changed, or you may get it changed for you, but not for everybody. So sometimes I think it, it, you do need people to make a stand and think, well, actually, this is wrong, and it shouldn't be like this. And for me and for other people, I want to see this this changed. And I think... If, if you weigh that up, then actually it's probably worth going through um, the, the pain of a lengthy court procedure um, to get that result and to change things for disabled people everywhere because there's still a lot that does need changing.